Once for how many people? All. But the life that he lives, he lives to whom? God. 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be what? To the sin problem, the condition. But alive to God, how? In Christ Jesus. And that is when you push the enter button, which is faith. That is your choice to be in Christ Jesus. Do you like the idea that you can spend the waking hours of each day with Jesus in his private office? Yes, you're here physically. But by faith, you can spend every day of your life, your waking hours, seven days a week, in Jesus' private office. Do you like that idea? It's not mine. It's from the author of the book, Desire of Ages. Verse uh, 12. Therefore, do not let the condition of sin reign in your mortal body, that you should what? Obey its lusts. 13. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to the sin condition as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members, the members of your body, hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, instruments of righteousness to God. That is your and my choice. <coughs> and that is why the question, is it possible to be deceived if you believe in God? The answer is, it is impossible to be deceived if you push that faith button. And now we understand what the faith button is. Is that good news? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Believing a deception requires that I have to what? Disbelieve something. Hang on. I have to disbelieve what? The truth. The result is that all who have not believed the truth, but have been taken, but have taken pleasure in unbelief, will be what? Condemned. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 and 12. What was your question, brother? We already covered that before you got here. Okay. And the word is S-I-N. Sin is talking about missing the mark. There's three definitions for the words. Well, there are many uses of the word for the word sin. They fall into three categories. Iniquity, my inclination, sin, missing the mark. It could be in ignorance, as you suggested from Leviticus, not knowing any better. And it can be transgression. We covered that in detail before you arrived, but that's a good point. The word sin is talking about missing the mark. We made a mistake. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses uh, 9 through 12. Who would like to volunteer to read that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Over here, sister. Because now we're focusing not only on what the issue is, but the solution to the issue. We're, don't, we're only talking about one thing here this morning. Deception and why Peter wrote 2 Peter chapters 2 and 3. People are coming, teachers, false prophets, are coming to deceive the people about whether Jesus is ever going to come back. We feel that that's an application to us. Because we call ourselves, what? What's the last part of our name? Adventists. 
we believe in Jesus' second coming. From what scripture do we get our lesson title today? 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But for the sake of context, so that we get the full picture, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And when you're there, say ready, and we will begin reading. For the sake of context, we're going to begin with verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Who would like to read verse 8 for us? Okay, Linda. To sum up, let all harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit not return as evil for evil. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Pardon? You want to give it another shot? Yep. Which one? Alright, three verse eight. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and as a, thou a thousand years is as one day. Thank you. Is that true? Yes. Of course. God lives in what? Eternity. Time is not an issue. But should time be an issue for us? Yes. Yes. Well, if we call ourselves Adventists, then how do we answer the question if <coughs> someone asks you, okay, when is Jesus coming back? Is it appropriate to say, Jesus is coming back when He gets good and ready to? No. Would that be an appropriate response? No. Huh? No. My wife asked a minister to that question. On October 24, 2015, the pastor had preached a sermon commemorating 171 years of the Seventh-day Adventist Church being on planet Earth. And he accurately and numbered or mentioned all of our accomplishments in our educational system, the hospital system, uh, evangelism, outreach, etc., 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 etc. After the service, my wife said, Thank you for your presentation. I have a question for you. We, you have just commemorated 171st birthday of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Is that correct? And she said, so when is Jesus coming back? And he said to her, Jesus is coming back, quote, when he gets good and ready to. And then he turned away to shake someone else's hand. Okay. We all have a right to our opinions. Right? And we must respect everyone's opinion. So. Jesus' disciples asked him a question when he was here in Matthew 24. That's what Matthew 24 is all about. And the question that his disciples asked him was, when are you coming back? And Jesus answers their question. He gives them a series of uh, answers from signs that they will see, beginning with what? the destruction of their temple, which they did not feel that was possible. That got their attention. Then he goes on to answer the question by mentioning events in nature. Like in Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30, where the sun and the moon will, you know, have an incredible visual uh, appearance, not scheduled. And the stars will fall like they have never fell before, fallen before. <coughs> Then he shares a parable about a fig tree in verses 32, 33, and 34. Let's turn to Matthew 24, verses 32, 33, and 34. And I'm going to read to you. Because this is a controversial word that we're going to look at here. Matthew 24. Beginning with verse 32. If you have subheadings in your Bible, 
there's a head subheading between verses 31 and 32, the parable of the fig tree. Now learn the parable of the, from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Have you ever grown a fig tree? Very delicious fruit. <coughs> it's almost indestructible. When in California we were growing a garden and my son said to me, my youngest son, how about if we grow a fig tree? And I said, good. Go in the house and get one of the fresh figs. He did. Came back. And I said to him, eat it. But don't spit out all the seeds. Okay. So then I got my foot and I scraped some dirt out of the way. And I said, get down there and spit those seeds in there. He did, then I covered it up. And he said, do we need to water it? I said, not really. This is Southern California. This is desert land. In time, the fig tree grew up. Amazing plant. So Jesus is using a very interesting parable here because the poorest people in Israel no matter how poor you were, they could afford a fig and then spit the seeds in their backyard and it would grow up. This is a very significant parable. <clears throat> you know that summer is near. Look at 33, continuing the sentence. Even so you too, when you see all these things that I've been telling you since verse 1 of Matthew 24, recognize that he is near at the door. At the what? Door. At the door. What does the door mean? <coughs> it's not over there in the middle of the way. It's right here. What is this? <laughs> when Jesus uses a parable, he's trying to paint a word picture of something that he wants for the people to remember. I don't care how long they've been going to school. This has nothing to do with education or intelligence. It has to do with whether your brain is working or not. Even at the door. Now look at verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation. That's a misunderstood word. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I looked at the word generation, Greek, genea. It's not speaking of a human race. It's speaking of a group of people that are living in a very specific period of history. So these people that have seen all these signs that Jesus is talking about, they will not pass away until they see what? The Son of Man come back. As Seventh-day Adventists, we must never forget that this corresponds also with Daniel 8.14. The longest time prophecy in the Bible. The 2300 day year prophecy. Fulfilled when? October 22nd, 1844. Connecting this with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Hebrews 9, 22 to 28. Now, how are you and I to understand these signs that Jesus gave to his disciples in answering their question, when are you coming back? In Matthew 24. How are you and I supposed to relate to this? The reason I say that is because there are conflicting thoughts, just like there were conflicting thoughts when we began our Sabbath school today, and I was asking the questions that I was asking. Are you familiar with the book, Desire of Ages? Yes. Let me read a very brief statement. This was written in, uh, eight, published in 1898, a long time ago. Page, beginning with the last word in page 633 and concluding in page 634. Had the Church of God done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. 
end quote. This was published in 1898. Are you familiar with a publication called The Adult Sabbath School Study Guide? Some of it, but you have it in your hand right now. Let me read to you what the editor of that publication wrote. The title of the lesson for that week was Hope and Delay, Part 2. Delay is a term that comes from only the human perspective. Second sentence. Time has continued longer than we, but not the Lord, may have expected. Does that sound like a contradiction? To what I just got to read it? Does that read Yes. yes. So how are you and I supposed to deal with these, call them conflicting, not contradicting, let's be nice, conflicting ideas? The author of the book Desire of Ages wrote an article regarding what you just, I just read to you in, Matt, in uh, Desire of Ages. She wrote this in 1901. It appears as the second chapter in the very last section of the book of Angelus. The title of the chapter is The Reason for the Delay. So apparently, as far as she's concerned, there is what? A delay. Now, the delay comes from my personal choice or my being what? Deceived. That's what we're studying this morning. That's what Peter is writing, 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3. Warning the people not to be deceived about whether Jesus is coming at all. We are exploring the connection to us as to when Jesus is coming back. So, let's go back now to 2 Peter chapter 3 and take a look very, very quickly. I'm going to have to read because I'm running out of time. 2 Peter, chapter 3, beginning, we already looked at verse 8. Who would like to read? Uh, I'll read verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to what? Repentance. What does the word repentance mean in the Bible? It means a turning around. Reevaluate your priorities. Reevaluate the direction that you're going in. Reevaluate your relationship with God. Verse 10. Here's the title to our lesson. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. What do you believe the term the day of the Lord means. His return. What? The return of Jesus Christ. Anyone else? Second coming. Second coming. What do you think that the day of the Lord means to those that don't believe in Jesus coming? <laughs> what do you think it means to them? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 6. And read verses 15, 16, and 17. Quickly, who would like to read verses 15, 16, and 17 of Revelation chapter 6? In verse 12, between verse 12 and 11, we have a subheading which says in chapter 6 of Revelation, the sixth seal. Verses 12 and 13 talk about what Jesus responded to his disciples. To the question, when are you coming back? And so he gives them a series of events in nature. Now, from verse 14 to 17, he tells them, or he inspires the John the Revelator to explain why this is not, why, whether that has happened now and when it is going to happen. So let's just read verses 15, 16, and 17 of Revelation chapter 6. Who would like to read that for us? Volunteer. Over here. Sorry, verse 14. 16. 15, 15, 16, and 17. Okay, and the kings of the earth 
and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, where the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Thank you. Very unusual behavior from people that were very cocky and say, there is no God. Jesus is never coming back. What unusual behavior. They're asking for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and kill them. Isn't that unusual? Wow. What a change in attitude. Asking rocks to destroy them. Trying to bring this to a conclusion because the time factor. Now, what kind of a response will the believers have to the day of the Lord? Who would like to read 2 Peter 3, verses 11 through 13? Second Peter 3, 11 to 13. Volunteer? Okay, right here. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness Amen. How is the word righteousness being used here? Let me answer it for you real quick because I'm running out of time. Same way that Jesus uses it in Matthew 3.15 when he asked John the Baptist to baptize him and he urges John to baptize him. For what reason? So that all what can be fulfilled? All righteousness can be fulfilled. The author of the book Desire of Ages says that we inherit a title of condemnation from Adam and Eve. But from Jesus, in Matthew 3.15, we inherit a title of what? <coughs> Righteousness, which is our title to heaven. Our title to heaven. I'm going very, very quick here. I'm not going to entertain any questions. Now, it's a crucial word for us to understand. There's three words in Scripture that you need to understand the meaning of if you're going to understand how you were saved, how to live the Christian life, and how Jesus guarantees that it's impossible to be lost if you choose to believe the meaning of these three words. The first one is what? Jesus has obtained for us a title of what? Righteousness. It's imputed to us. You have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Now the question is, does that mean that everybody's going to be in heaven? Of course not. So now, how do I live this life? Are we trying to determine how we want to live our life? Romans 8, 4. Who would like to read Romans 8, 4? Real quick. Romans 8, 4. Romans 8, 4. Same word righteousness, but a different meaning. Yes, in English it's righteousness, but in the original language it's a different meaning. The meaning in Matthew 3, 15, the word is dikaiosune. Means a title. You have a new title. Jesus has taken away the title of condemnation. Now you have a new title. The question is, how are you going to drive this vehicle now that you have a new driver's license? Can we identify with that? Yes. Have you ever had a citation? Yes. I have. <laughs> After I pay my fine, does that make me a good driver? No. No, no that ticks me off. <laughs> That's what it does. Okay? Now, Romans 8.4. How do we drive this vehicle? Who would like to read Romans 8.4? 8, 8, Anyone? Okay, Tom. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay, the word requirement that he read in the original language is righteousness. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in those that do not walk according to the what? Flesh. flesh. But according to the what? Spirit. Spirit. And that's who I call, Jesus calls him the paracletos, the Holy Spirit, the helper. Para means parallel. Kletos means helper. Right next to us. So if we invite him in, what will he do? 
He'll drive our vehicle during the waking hours of each day. Do you like that arrangement? Amen. Huh? Yeah. All you have to do is bump, <coughs> saying, take over. Why do you have to bump it? Because we kicked him out in the Garden of Eden when we decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. Read Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 4. Not now. So, that's what it means. And that word in the Greek is dikaioma. Ellen White calls it imparted righteousness. So you have a title of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. You're titled to heaven. And now you decide to access Jesus' designated driver when he was here on the earth. Which is who? The Holy Spirit. is the Holy Spirit. And that's what it's saying. Revelation 19, verse 8, 7 and 8 says what? Let us rejoice and be glad. For the bride has finally decided to what? Let the Holy Spirit drive her. That's what it's saying. The Holy Spirit is driving her. And what does that produce? Righteous works. Same word in Revelation 19, 8, as in Romans 8, 4. Same word. Now, what does all of this, how does all of this seal, guarantee, ready for delivery? Romans 5, 18. As through one act of unrighteousness, condemnation came upon the whole human race, also by one act of righteousness, justification of life came to all human beings. Does that mean that everybody's going to be saved? No. It's talking that, about what Jesus has done. He gave us a what? A title of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. And He's given us what? The Holy Spirit to drive this vehicle for as long as you live. And it guarantees incredible results. Amen. And what does make that what does that make that a guarantee, a done deal? Well, we, I just quoted to you in Romans 5, 18. He has given us from a title of condemnation, a title of justification of life. That word, their justification, in the Greek is dikaiosis. If you have a Strong's, you can look it up. It's 1347. The first one, Matthew 315, is 1343. Look it up. You need to look these things up. Don't you dare accept anything I say. I may be deceiving. Amen. And the second word, as far as the works of righteousness, is number 1345, dikaiosis. So the word in, in Romans 5.18, dikaiosis, is acquitted. You have been acquitted. You have been acquitted. You now stand before God as Adam and Eve did before they sinned. Do you like that? Amen. Amen. Romans 5, 11. You've been reconciled. The only way of preventing from being deceived is to understand the meaning of these three words. Now, let's drop down to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. It's a misunderstood, there's a misunderstood word here. I'll read verse 14 so that the rest of it makes sense. Therefore, beloved, since I'm reading 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in what? Peace, spotless and blameless. Peace is the first blessing of justification by faith. Romans 5, 1. The second word is spotless. How do we become spotless? By allowing the Holy Spirit to drive this vehicle. He guarantees what? Sinless living. And the third word is blameless. That means if you have no blame against you, that means that you have allowed God to reproduce His character in you. The third blessing is justification by faith, Romans 5, 2. Now, back to 2 Peter 3, 16. I'll read 15 quickly. And regard the patience of our Lord towards salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Now, listen very carefully. 16. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. What these things? What are these things? Not to be deceived. In which some things hard to understand, which the untaught, the ignorant, that's a real word, and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. The word hard to understand in the Greek is dus moetos. The word dus means miss. 
Doetus means understand. Misunderstood. That doesn't mean that they're hard to understand. They have been what? Misunderstood by whom? By the ignorant. Your Bible may say untaught. And who else? Unstable. Who distort God's word. 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3 is dealing with one topic. Deception. Jesus is coming back when you and I decide we want for Him to come back. And don't let anyone, although we must respect everyone's right to their opinion, don't let anyone